What the Tech is sponsored by Audible.com, the internet's leading provider of audiobooks with more than 100,000 downloadable titles across all types of literature. For a free audiobook of your choice, go to audiblepodcast.com slash Andrew. And by Stitcher Radio. Listen on the go via the Stitcher mobile app. For more information, go to stitcher.com slash GFQ. Everybody, welcome to What the Tech. It is election day here in the United States. And um, I, I walked to the polls and I voted and I walked back and I said, why am I even voting? My vote doesn't even matter in New York. Uh, but I'm joined by Paul Therod. Paul, did you vote today? No, I'm out of state. Oh, yeah, you can't vote. And I live in Massachusetts, so my vote doesn't matter either. It doesn't matter. I mean, it, it really, it doesn't matter. It, it's actually funny because I said that to my younger brother yeah. and he's 20. Not, not, I mean, not much younger. And he didn't understand the electoral process. Sure. Why would he? He's American. Yeah. And, and my, my brain, <laughs> my, my head just exploded at the, yep. the, the fact that he did not understand it. But um, it's election day and uh, we'll see who's going to win. Uh, early polls, I guess, early Analysts uh, on MSNBC are saying that by a landslide, Barack Obama won. And on Fox News, by a landslide, Mitt Romney's winning. Great. So uh, we're back to square one. But there's a lot of tech stuff to talk about, Paul. You're Thank still God. not home. Right. Uh, who knows when you're going to be back? I, well, I, I, I assume I, I, never. I have some idea. I assume never. The over-under on this is not working it's out never. for you. <laughs> it's never. Because I do kind of like it here. I you have know, to say. It felt like Groundhog Day because you called me and I'm like, wait a minute, are you in Washington? And you go, yeah. I'm like, but you were there last week. And you said, yeah. <laughs> and? And? You have a point to make, sir. And for a minute, I felt like it was like a deja vu, like I was hallucinating all of last week. Right. But I'm not. I'm just excited for Bill to start. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Bill just started, right? Can't wait to see what they do. So you're headed back uh, tomorrow. Yeah, it's uh, tomorrow, actually. Uh, there's a big storm coming to the uh, East Coast once again, and uh, a lot of flights are going to be delayed, so we'll see what happens. Oh, boy. So on to some tech stuff. I, I Since it's Election Day, I wanted to talk about this a little bit because it's the way that we consume information has totally changed over the last 10 years. That's for sure. Uh, of course, it was newspapers prior to television, and now it's all the information, all the news that I'm consuming is online. I have not watched any news coverage on the networks. Right. And I wonder not, if that's... I'm a, not even sure they're still around. It's it's amazing to me. I mean, this is probably the first election that I have not turned on CNN, MSNBC, or, or Fox News to get any kind of information. All the information I'm consuming is online through, uh, you know, smaller blogs that, that, are, that cover politics or you know sometimes i go to C uh, cnn or i go to uh, bbc or, or even fox but it, th this is interesting because for me this is the first time i'm not you know i don't have the tv on during election day to see you know what's happening what the analysts are saying well We're, i mean we wouldn't oh, well whatever okay yep but is this is this a good thing or is, or is this a bad thing because there's so much information online yeah. and a lot of it you know we talk about skewed bloggers you know like people's opinions are already set in place there's a lot of apple blogs that are anti-microsoft a lot of microsoft wait, blogs wait, wait. there are apple blogs that are anti-microsoft it's I, surprising I, I, i've never heard of this it's really surprising and one I of the big that... complaints that i have is that they report opinions as facts yeah but you see that with politics also sure well i would just say that uh, cable news programs, you mentioned Fox News and MSNBC, were the predecessor of this kind of thing, uh, opinion as fact, and uh, highly partisan broadcasts, you know, each of them in their own way. And naturally, as we move to the Internet, uh, we have even more partisan <laughs> viewpoints. I, I think the fear here is that people become less tolerant of opinions that differ from their own, which, by the way, is the problem I'm having on Twitter right now, which yeah. is, you know, people refuse to listen to logic or reason, and 
don't want to tune in to people who aren't just parroting things that align with their worldview, you know, or or I extreme think. views. I mean, your you know, I read your review today of the iPod Mini, uh, iPad Mini, and the iPod Touch, yep. and it was it was pretty pro Apple. Yeah, I well, mean, well, pro Apple. I mean, it was just. No, it was fair. It was fair. I mean, you gave an honest opinion. You said these devices are great devices. The iPod Touch is a great device. Uh, you knocked Apple a little bit about an outdated UI, which we've all discussed, and even Apple... Yep, uh, it didn't beat it to death because no. it's not worth beating to death. It's just I have to throw it in there, but... But you didn't pick a side. I mean, it wasn't like, this is the worst thing in the world. I'm a Microsoft. I write about Microsoft. I write about well, Windows, and this is... Uh, everything else sucks. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I, certainly I've written highly critical articles of whatever. I mean, I criticized Surface last week. I've certainly dumped on iTunes in my day because it is terrible. But it's not directed at because I hate Apple or I love Microsoft or whatever. It's just I, I'd like to think I'm consistent with this kind of stuff. I mean, sure. uh, I don't know. But, yeah, you know, there, there are people who um, – well, you know what? Actually – I don't think I'm any less biased than anyone else. I, I, I have a worldview to push as well. I mean, in the same way that we might describe uh, personal attributes in ways that are positive when we're talking about ourselves and maybe negative when we're talking about someone else, you know, I would like to think that I am even handed and, and fair. And I know from my email that not everyone believes that statement. Yeah. So uh, certainly uh, opinions vary. But, uh, you know, you can only do what you do. But tech news is one thing. I mean, the stuff that we talk about is this kind of tiny niche thing that doesn't necessarily impact history or, or life. Um, politics is a, is a much deeper issue. Sure. And, uh, and I think we, but when we, if I'm watching Fox, I kind of understand. And even if I know nothing about politics, I understand what side they lean on. You and think? I'll, yeah, I mean, <laughs> listen, same with MSNBC. I kind of, but you know, one thing about MSNBC, let me just add in. I think that like their set to me looks better than Fox's. I don't know why. That is actually an excellent way to judge them. That's that's the that's the first way that I, I look at. I'm like, this looks better for me. Uh, but when, I would when say I'm that watching the it, speakers on Fox tend to be more attractive and usually blonde women. Yes. So you say than you see on MSNBC. I'm sure that's not a coincidence, but an interesting difference. No, that you're absolutely right. Um, but when I'm watching the, the, I mean CNN, it's supposed to be in the middle, but they they go they go a little to the side too, but. When I'm watching the news, I kind of know what to expect, even though I know nothing about politics. But when I, if I'm reading, <laughs> if I'm reading, yeah. let's say uh, an article on Engadget, and they're beating up, let let's say the iPod Touch, which never will happen, but let's say they're destroying, they're saying this is the worst device ever made. I don't know why they made this thing. Right. And I'm reading that. I don't know what side this guy is on. For all I know, he's being totally honest, and I'm not going to go buy this device. But he could totally have a, a agenda. an agenda behind it. I mean, with BlackBerry, you see it now because everybody beats up on him. Yeah. Well, almost pointlessly. Yeah, like this... if, 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 I'm, if I'm new to this and I'm reading an article by Tom Warren, I'm not going to know what side he's going on. <laughs> it won't take long to figure out. I mean, no. but, but, <laughs> but yeah. um, sure. I, 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 look, I, I, unfortunately, in 1999, when I started the super site for Windows, Windows was general purpose computing. If you if we were going to have a discussion about technology, it all involved the personal computer, and 95% of personal computers ran Windows. And so my site was called the Super Site for Windows. If I was going to start this over again today, the word Windows would not be appearing in the name of my site. I can tell you that much. What would you call it? I mean, have I you ever thought about renaming? No, I, I don't know. But But when I look out at the world of personal computing today, because I care deeply about personal technology, um, obviously you still see Windows and it's going to be a big deal for a long time to come and if they do things right it will be an even bigger deal but there's also obviously uh, smartphones which are a much bigger market and that's Android You know, 75% yeah. of all phones sold in the third quarter were Android phones and so Android is in many ways the Windows of the smartphone world on the tablet side it's getting a little interesting it looks like it's going to very soon be 50-50 uh, between Android and um, and the iPad, so it's a different different market. You know, it's tough for me to ignore any of that stuff because it's such a big audience and a lot of crossover. You know, I think a lot of people who own iPads have Windows machines. A lot sure. of 
people have Android phones have Windows machines. No, I, I don't think I don't think listen, I'm a mixed environment. I mean, I'm on a MacBook Pro and that's my everyday computer, but everything around me is a Windows machine and I couldn't live without the Windows machines. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, I guess I could I could down, I could go down this narrow path and um uh, and just write about Windows Phone and I could just write about Windows tablets and I could pretend that everything was fine. Uh, but actually I don't think everything is fine. And um <laughs> so I look at other things and but in the world where you have to pick an extreme, I mean, with politics, it's like that. Everybody has an agenda. The same goes for technology and, and tech blogs. Well, I feel uh, like it, they, a lot I'm of these blogs feel that they have to have this strong opinion on one and totally bash the other one in order to get viewers. Strong, strong opinion sells. There's no doubt about that. But the, we have these topics in our society that are like bugaboo, right? Like you can't, you can't do this. You can't have an intelligent conversation about politics. You can't have a conversation about religion, you know? But these things to me are all really simple and logical and actually very easily explained. And I don't understand why more people aren't middle of the road on everything. You know, that it seems to me that the further out on the fringes you get on the right or the left, the crazier you are and the the more tenuous a hold on reality that you have, you know. Um, so I tend to be just a centrist on all things. So like I said, you know, when I started my own site just looking at technology, I called it Windows something. But I mean, really... We're just talking about most people. The point was to reach an audience of normal people, like actual regular, you know, regular people, the people yeah. actually using this stuff. And today it's different. Um, the well, it, stuff, seems, it seems like you're called a hypocrite the second you say, you know what, I actually like the Mac or I actually like this device. And all of a sudden people say, well, you said three yeah. months ago that you didn't like it. Yep. Well, you know, you said when, when the iPad came out, you criticized it for this. Yeah. Well, I did. The iPad came out in early 2010, by the way. That was two and a half years ago. I said it would have been a dumb. I did not get it. I didn't get it when the thing came out. And I said, why would anybody want to spend $500 on iPod an oversized touch. iPod Touch? And you know what? I was wrong. Sure. It's still an oversized iPod Touch, but I was totally wrong. Yeah. You know, it, it, we're not allowed to uh, adjust our opinions of things as more information arrives, you know, which, which to me is, again, the only logical thing to do, you know. Um, so, whatever. I, I can't speak for political commentators or uh, religious crazies or whatever, but, I mean, to me, like I said, I mean, this stuff is all very straightforward. I, I'm a little confused by the way people act, whether it's on Twitter, where there are a bunch of ass clowns, or whether it's in the comment section of my blog, or whether it's in uh, on MSNBC or on Fox News or whatever. Whether it's these religious freakazoids that make movies about Muhammad and cause attacks in Libya or whatever, it was, you know, it's just crazy. Like there's just extreme extremism is always. Oh, well, it's always going to sell. I mean, listen, I'm the worst person because uh, you know, always, socially, I'm pretty, I'm pretty liberal on a certain thing, on, on on many things, and and fiscally, I'm pretty conservative. So who, who you know, what am I going to do? You are a hypocrite. I'm a hypocrite. How could how could you how could you have two points? I mean, I, I just wanted to talk about that a little bit because I saw such a parallel between, uh, you know, the the tech pundits and the political pundits and and how they it's the same first information. That's a bigger world, and it's a more important world. And I feel like these people have a much greater responsibility than we do to accurately portray what's going on in their worlds because it impacts people in a much higher level. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. Because most people, I mean, the people that are found the technology online generally are kind, of, are kind of with it yeah and you know whatever I, I there's no reason just to take it back to technology i mean i make some assertion like i think the window the htc windows phone 8x is the best windows phone you know um i will get a never-ending series of emails and tweets from people who say oh you're an idiot because it doesn't have expandable storage or you're an idiot because it doesn't have a bigger screen or you're an idiot because it doesn't have a slightly better camera or whatever and look I have an opinion. You have an opinion. I don't understand why you can't just express that and move on. <laughs> it's yeah, yeah. People, like they, they want to beat you down until you, they, they drag some admission out of you that they might be right. And it's like, guys, no one's right. I, I, what I, when I wrote about that particular phone in this particular instance, what I was saying is, I'm using this phone. This is the one I'm using. Now, you can pick whatever you want. I don't care. <laughs> There's nothing necessarily wrong with it. I gave some reasons for why I think it's better than the competition or whatever. But you know, it's amazing to me how the fanboy thing rises up like some unwanted wave of, uh, you know, violent stupidity. And, um, you know, you used to see this with Linux all the time. You see it still with, you know, you used to see it with the Mac. You still see it with the Apple guys. You know, now we're seeing it with Surface. We're seeing it with the uh, the Nokia stuff. I mean, there's a, a weird little subset of the user base out there that just can't stand the thought that 
Nokia is a really poorly run company that doesn't make very good products. And, you know, that's my opinion. Now, you can disagree with it. It's fine. Buy one. Yeah. Go nuts. Um, I've been using a Nokia phone for the past several months. It's great. Um, but you've also said that the HTC uh, 8X is the phone. It's better. Yeah. For me. It's an opinion. <laughs> you know, it's just whatever. I, I, I would never look at someone using a 920 and walk up to them and say, oh, you're an idiot. Why would you ever use that phone? I completely understand why someone would want with that phone. It's a nice phone. It's a big phone. It's a thick phone. It's a heavy phone. Um, those are some of the things I don't like about it. But it's got a superior camera. It's got a beautiful screen. It's very powerful. It's got a lot of storage and so forth. It's nice. Nokia apps are great. There's all kinds of great reasons to use it. So from last week to now, have you changed your mind on the Surface at all? Have you have you discovered certain things that you like or don't like with it? <laughs> uh, no. What's going to fix the Surface is time and more apps yeah. and you know better compatibility. There's all there's there's the thing that people don't understand is. It's always going to be the little thing that gets you, you know. It's going to be the browser add-in that you actually do need for work to get something done, and it's just not there because you can't do that stuff. Uh, two examples that came up recently for me was, I because I'm traveling, I missed The Walking Dead, which I watch with my family usually on Sunday nights, and so on Monday I wanted to download it and watch it on some device, and so I picked up the Surface first. I went to Xbox Video. Not available, but it was available at Amazon. It was available at Google, and it was available on iTunes. And so I could have gotten it anywhere except on the Surface. Yeah, and that's irritating. You know that that's one of those little things. It's like the little, you know, final mile type thing. Um, but I mean, again, those things are going to happen with a a first gen device, right? But we are now in the time frame of a first-gen device. It's not March. It's not next June. It's now. And these are the problems now. I, a lot of people say to me, you know, I, you know uh, when, not, when, no compatibility with Windows Phone is, uh, 7 is not a problem on Windows RT. And then what comes through in the conversation is he has a Windows Phone 7 device, which he cannot use with Windows RT. The reason this is not a problem is because in two weeks, he's going to be able to buy a new Windows 8 phone, a Windows Phone 8 handset from AT&T or whoever he has, and thus it is not a problem. Dude, <laughs> yeah. There are millions of people who have Windows Phone 7 devices that are not going to be able to upgrade right away, and they're just stuck. So just because it's not a problem for you because you like to blindly spend money on Microsoft products all the time doesn't mean that it's not a problem. It's just you, you have decided to ignore the problem and spend money to solve it. And I, it's that kind of irrational argument that just kind of drives me crazy. A lot of people assume that when I write something, I'm very specifically ignoring some wider world of people when in fact that is who I write for. Um, a Surface is not an appropriate di device for me personally, but I never gave it marks off for that. You know, I happen to be a big guy. I can't use a small screen with a small keyboard. I'm not really, this is never going to be my daily use machine or whatever. I'm not going to just travel with this even. Um, that is not something I give it a mark down for. I realize that I am unique in that way and that most people would be fine using this kind of form factor. So let me ask you this, Paul, and, and we, I actually got a lot of emails asking for this after, uh, you know, you went on a little rant about the surface, which a lot, a lot of people agreed with you. I mean, most people agreed with you. Most uh, people eventually agree with me. Yeah, most people eventually agree with you. you. You actually said that to me. I forgot what it was. I'm like, you were right. You're like most of the time I am. Um, <laughs> no, 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 no. I mean, <laughs> on this case specifically. On this case, yes. Um, a lot just ignoring reality for a moment because they want this thing to be awesome and perfect. But if Paul Therott could have had the perfect Microsoft Surface, what would it have been? What would have been different? All right, so right, I can answer that question. Although, I, I, just to be fair, the Surface is never going to be perfect for me no matter what it is because, again, the, the portable device I'm using right now, the machine I'm using as we do this, is what I believe is still the only 15-inch Ultrabook on the market. This machine, like anything else in technology, is not perfect. I wish the keyboard was better, but it's it's usable. But it, otherwise, it is perfect. It's a perfect size, weight, screen size, screen resolution. For me, this is perfect. I'm not asking for a 15-inch version of a Surface. So the question you just asked me, I cannot answer. But the question I will answer, which I think is more relevant, is what would be – Not that, there's no such thing as perfect, but what would be the device, the Surface, that I think would be more – yeah. Um, assuming that this Clover Trail atom-based processor has the performance characteristics, 
I expect it to and hope it will have, i.e. something that is better than the current Surface, the ARM-based Surface. I think that product with a Clovertrail chip inside and thus compatibility with desktop apps would have made a m much more sense as the entry-level device and that the Pro version could continue as it was as with uh, you know the Ivy Bridge stuff. But doesn't that whole kill the entire you know separation between RT and... Why is there a separation? If, if I, we, I, pricing? I, yeah. I mean, and, and no, actually, no. They're, they're almost the same price, to be honest. They should be exactly the same price. And so if you can have all the things that are good about ARM, uh, good battery life, really thin and light, fanless form factors, and compatibility with desktop apps. Yeah. Done. You know, there are niggling things after that. The um, the power connector on the surface is is broken. It just doesn't work right. It this thing should have two USB ports. A Clovertrail version of this chip could have, of this uh, device could have USB three instead of USB two. You know, all of those things would would work and serve to improve this device. Yeah, I mean, last week we were speaking about the hypothetical. Uh, I think two weeks ago, if let's say app developers, you know, program developers started making. ARM-based desktop applications. Right. And a lot of people, I guess they might have missed that show, but a lot of people sent that yeah, that hypothetical to me and said, can this happen? And yeah. why hasn't it happened yet? I actually think it could and should happen. And uh, Microsoft already has a system in place for approving apps and so forth. And why not open it up to desktop apps? And might, why not make that the only way that desktop apps can appear on Windows RT? I think that'd be great. I think it would be great too. And so Chrome, uh, Google could do that with Chrome. Mozilla could do that with Firefox. Uh, Adobe could do that with their their applications. Porting desktop application, assuming, see, I'm making assumptions. I don't really know about how the Win32 APIs translate, but assuming that all of the underlying technology is there and is the same, it would be a much better situation for developers and then thus for users uh, to allow that. But I don't think they're ever going to do that. I, I, I sort of see no reason why they can't, but I, I just don't, I don't well, see that. Right. Well, it kind of, you know, it kind of ties into something that I wanted to talk about. And, and I do want to go back to some of the Microsoft stuff because there's a lot of news. But um, Micro, uh, Apple had major shakeups over yeah. the last week. By uh, the way, I, <laughs> I am ecstatic by what happened at Apple. Um, I believe I changed, I, I misspelled everybody's name on this because I didn't, <laughs> I didn't run it back. But uh, Johnny Ive is in charge of hardware and software design and, which is good. design and, and Forrestal is totally replaced at this point so Scar Forrestal was a mm, uh, someone who continued the Steve Jobs skeuomorphism stuff which is the worst design decision in the history of computing was, that, just, was that a Steve Jobs thing like the leather wrapping around it I mean but, sent them a, a, a picture or something of a piece of sti stitching and said he wanted it in iOS, and it's that cross-stitch thing you see in the background of everything. Um, making a calendar look like a paper calendar, making a podcast app look like a reel-to-reel -reel tape is just ridiculous. And, you know, when you think about the point of... It, it, the start of this stuff is almost the photorealistic icons that first started appearing in Mac OS X, that, you know, icons were meant literally to be icons. They weren't meant to be photographic representations. They were meant to be something that, you know, that quickly suggested, you know, the, the point of the Metro stuff in Windows Phone and in Windows 8 is that you can glance at something and understand what it means no matter what language you speak. You know, it works like the yeah. transit science you see in trains and subways and so forth. Um, having a little tear mark on the top of a calendar as if someone had torn off the previous month or something, it's just, it's just, it's bad design. It's lazy. It's just bad. And, it doesn't the, translate um, well in, in many situations. Stupid. And the, the people who use these apps, by and large, are younger people who have actually never seen a paper calendar, yeah, yeah. real to real tape, or whatever these other real-world objects from the past are. So I, I, I am ecstatic at the thought that that might completely go away. And as much as I would like iOS to be overhauled, just from a complete usage experience standpoint, I almost think that you know, fixing the front end of it would be as big of a deal. Of iOS. And all those apps. Well, I, I mean, the, the rumors are now coming out, and we've discussed this. That you, iOS has kind of become the dinosaur of the operating systems where it really hasn't, the UI has not evolved over the last, you know, five years. That's what they do. 
I mean, they, they've tweaked it, but it stayed the same. Yep. And, and you know what? They kind of had to because they became, the, they became the safe bet. Everybody wanted it. And why, why change it if everybody's buying and that's what they want? But it seems like the shakeup is a total revamp of, okay, what are we going to do now? What are we going to do with iOS? What are we going to do with the Mac operating system? How are we going to evolve this over the next year or two? And it, it's interesting to kind of see what they will do with it. Because what do you do with iOS, really? Like, I could, I, could, I could come up with ideas. Like, if somebody said, okay, if you could, with Windows Phone, you know, what did Windows have to do with Windows Mobile to make it a, yeah. a, a device that people want to buy? And I would have said they would have to do something totally different than everybody else. Oh, and that's what they did. And that's what they did. Because they had to do it. I mean, they really, they had no other option. Right. So I was going to say, you can't make that kind of revolution until you're dead in the water, right? Um, when Apple, the only real innovation, actually, there were two moments of innovation, I would say, in the iPhone and on iOS. The, the first was obviously the first rendition of it and the first iPhone, right? A, an amazingly revolutionary device. The problem with Apple is they tend to make something like that once and then they just um, evolve it forever and ever. I mean, Mac OS X has done that. Uh, now for over a decade. iOS has been doing it since 2007. Um, second revolution with the iPhone, of course, was the uh, the App Store. But the the I would the have said copy and paste, Paul. <laughs> the basic UI hasn't changed at all, so they've been kind of layering stuff on top of it. And um, it's, to be fair to Apple, because we've seen this with Microsoft in the past, it's really hard to make big changes when you suddenly have hundreds of millions of customers, hundreds of millions of devices out in the world, uh, you have de de developers that are relying on certain things being the case. I mean, they already have a screwy combination of um, screen resolutions they have to support as developers. I mean, how awful that must be in aspect ratio differences and so forth. It's four, four different screen uh, sizes. It would be very simple, and so it must be fairly difficult now to, to do that stuff. But, you know, they're protective. They're not innovating anymore. They're protecting. Now they have this big market that they need to protect. Completely understandable, but you know, companies in that position approach things in, in a very different way. So, uh, you know, I, I guess I would say, you know, this puts what Microsoft did with Windows 8 in a, a different perspective because yeah, I hope it demonstrates how amazing it was for them to make this change now because Microsoft is making this change in Windows 8 before everything goes south. When they just sold 670 million copies of Windows 7. It was the biggest success story in the history of Windows. And if they and if they did nothing with Windows 8 and they just kept it the way it was and just added a couple of features, nobody would have said anything. They would have said, so, wow, look how great Windows 8 is. But the problem is in the background, they would have been losing elsewhere yeah. and things really started deteriorating behind the scenes, not with Windows specifically, but with you know the other parts of the market that they, that, that version of Windows never would have served. So I, that is amazing to me, and I, it's that's the type of leap that Apple has to make. So I actually think that getting rid of Scott Forstall was very interesting because it's clear he was kind of a jerk. I think he didn't get along with everybody there, and it's completely understandable how that could be the case. But was he years, behind? Was he behind Maps? Yeah. So actually, yeah. the reason he was fired was because he refused to apologize for Maps. Yeah, which so, is it, 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 it's it's an abomination. I mean, the thing is awful. It's funny. I actually don't think it's as bad. It's bad as that, but it, it's clearly it has the stink of badness about it. In the same way that you know Vista did, and Windows Me did, and uh, you know Mobile Me did. Like some products, even though they're not horrible, as horrible as people think they are, they it, you know you get the stink on you and you can't shake it. And clearly, Maps has that problem, which is too bad. I don't know. So, what do you think they're going to do now? Now that Johnny Ive is uh, in charge of design for software and, and hardware, do you think we're going to start seeing some radical changes to their uh, Mac OS? Uh, think about what he's famous for, right? He is famous for simplicity of design. And it, when you apply that to software, um, I, frankly, I think you get something like Metro on Windows Phone, but uh, I thought it was very interesting. You probably don't read the site. Um, I, I subscribe to the RSS feed for Cult of Mac, which is uh, the the Fox News of the Mac world. They're yeah. absolutely insane, um, and I do it just to have that perspective to you know keep it in front of my eyes. It's the one thing that it's very painful to do because it's often ridiculous. But they had a, a picture. You know, here's a picture of the note taking app in iOS. What might it look like with Johnny Ive in place? So instead of the torn off paper effect and the dog-eared paper, what if they have the lines on the yellow pad? What might it look like as a clean, beautiful Johnny Ive design. Looks a lot like Windows Phone, as it turns out. You know, So I'm sure that the Apple faithful will rally around this flat, beautiful 
Metro style UI once it's on iOS. Um, and I hope that that's what happens and I don't care. I think that would be great. I, it's really strange because I think we had this conversation. I, I really hammer home how bad the UI for iOS is again and again and again. But the part I really don't explain enough is that it would be so easy to fix because it's really just front end. You know, if you think about it, the screen where you launch apps from, that could be almost anything. There's, there's no reason they couldn't add uh, Android-style widgets, you know, for example. There's no reason they couldn't um, support icons of multiple sizes, like on Windows Phone, and, and give developers the APIs they need to expose information from the app on the surface of that icon, just like we do in Windows Phone. I mean, hopefully they'll go in their own direction, but it's really not hard to imagine how easy it would be to fix iOS. So for no, I'll, uh, yeah, no, you're absolutely right. I don't think it would be that difficult. I, I think the problem with iOS right now is they've added and they've changed certain features, and the streamlined operating system that it was is no longer streamlined as much. I, I think that there's uh, there's one major problem right now for me with iOS, and it's the App Store. I think they ruined the App Store. The iOS App Store. The iOS App Store. It takes. Before, it was instantaneous. You know, when you clicked on it, it would show the front screen. It takes time to load now. So, do you know what the worst part of iOS is? This is kind of a strange complaint in a way, but I, I just noticed this from using... Uh, I noticed this, you know, when I got the iPod uh, Touch again and with the iPad Mini, same thing. When you get the device out of the box, which is obviously a, lo- a lovingly crafted Apple experience, and you unwrap it from its sarcophagus that it's in or whatever, and you turn it on for the first time, the amount of time it takes to go from that first boot to actually using it on the home screen is is astronomical. And the reason is they have this setup thing on the device that takes forever to get through. There's something like 27 different steps you have to get wow. through. It is That is an abomination. The, the amount of things you have to do just to get to use the device is approximately eight times as many things as you have to do in Windows 8 to go from beginning to end of setup. It's, it's amazing how time-consuming it is and how many steps there are. And how illogical that some of it is. I mean, it's like there's like a next button that's on the top. You have to click down at the bottom to select one of the items, go back to the top. It's like this, this whole navigational nightmare, part of which is necessitated by the fact that this thing doesn't have hardware back button or, you know, any hardware buttons at all. So they have to build this stuff into the UI. I'm actually trying to find the image that you were talking about. If I could, ah, here it is. I don't know if uh, you could see the video, Paul, but this is the uh, image you were saying how. If Johnny Ive designed it and uh, what it looks like now, this would be the difference. Nice fonts. Very nice fonts. And I'll tell you, Microsoft did a great job with that. And, and the fonts that they're using is, you know, when I look at it, I could tell this is a Windows phone based <laughs> well, on the fonts. This is Microsoft. You know, they've kind of, it's the same thing all across the board now. You know, uh, whether you're talking about a Mac or um, any of the iOS devices, the, the, the thing that has been consistent, or iPods, you know, the consistent thing here has been that the hardware is irreproachable. It's always beautiful. It's just beautiful. You know, they they may not uh, do things from a functional standpoint that makes sense, like the antenna on the iPhone four or whatever, but they're always beautiful. Um, the the place where Apple has always fallen apart for me is software. The software has always been terrible. I mean, people talk about Mac OS ten being easy to use, which is ludicrous. It's only easy to use if you're used to using it. It's like it, it, it gives you no indication at all of how to do anything or what you should click next or you know what you should be doing. I, I've always found it to be kind of inscrutable. But if Johnny Ives has a hand in the design of the software, I mean, who knows? He may work out to be someone who can't design software. Sure. I, guess. I have really high hopes that. The guy who did the thing that is most special about Apple's products, the hardware, is not going to be in charge of the software. I mean, I think they have an awesome chance. No, uh, I do too. Uh, I, I, think, I think that's actually great news for, for anybody that uses an Apple product. That says aluminum. I'm just saying. Aluminum, yeah. My father says aluminum. Yeah. He hey, listen, that's... it's aluminum. That's what he says. We have to recycle. <laughs> listen, Andrew, don't throw away the cans. It's always yelling at me. Um... One thing that is fascinating, there were rumors this week that Apple might abandon Intel and go to to their chipset, which will be an ARM-based chip. Sure. I don't, you know, when, when I read this, I said, you know, this is really stupid. I do not see them doing this. There's right. no possible way they'll do it. But never say never. Yep. Apple's all about controlling the hardware that they use. Uh, and this is extremely realistic in a world where ARM is dominating almost everything, and even on the uh, on the Microsoft side, where they oh. they're kind of putting their eggs into this ARM basket. 
I, I guess two thoughts to this. I mean, I don't know about Apple's chips per se because those aren't strictly ARM designs, right? I mean, ARM chips are nowhere near as powerful as Intel chips. Um, Apple's chips, I don't know, who knows? Maybe there's some next generation thing coming. Um, you know that these chips are in very thin and light devices, so it's the potential for adding multiple chips is there. I mean, I guess you could have, instead of having like a four, a quad core of CPU, you could have four CPUs. That could be a Mac Mini or a Mac. But what baffles me is why would they do it? Why? And, and the same goes for uh, on, the, on the PC side. If yep. you have the option between Intel, which is compatible with everything, uh, or this new thing that's called ARM that there's really no applications developed for it and it's, it's, it's fairly new and it's not fast, why would you abandon Intel and go to this new platform? That, that was my question. Why would, why would Apple do this? And I asked that to someone. They said, why wouldn't Apple do this? Yep. They've done it the, before. Right. They're, well, they've done it before, which just means they should be able to handle it. Um, but why would they? In other words, what's the rationale for this? Um, companies like Apple like to control the whole widget. Um, this is something you see in Microsoft with the Windows team. A lot of people aren't aware of this, but um, there have been a lot of internal initiatives squashed at Microsoft uh, because they were not made by that team. You know, that they like to reinvent everything and have their own have their own stuff. You know, the build conference I just went to, uh, the reason that that exists is because the Windows team wanted to control the developer conference, which used to be PDC, which used to be owned by a different group at Microsoft, not by the Windows team. So they're consolidating their power and they're doing everything themselves. Um, when you go, it, let's just, you know, speaking theoretically, if Apple were to go to their own shit, you know, the A6 or A7 or whatever they're going to call it, you know, uh, you lose some interesting things there. You lose the ability to take a Mac and run Windows on it, right? That may be part sure. of the plan. Um, it, it also is a statement to the fact that Apple has described itself as a mobile devices company. I mean, maybe this is a, um, a pointer to the future of the company as they see it where, you know, maybe it's just going to be mobile devices. Maybe the, those Macs of the future that run on that chip will be just the mobile versions. But what will all the people do that are using Photoshop and they're editing videos? Yeah. I mean, they're, they're totally alienating that group. But again, the story is saying that, it, first of all, it's, it's, it's a you rumor. Know? Number two, they're saying they won't be ready till 2017. So we have quite a few years okay. to and further it, develop. Yeah, I don't, I don't think the chip that we have today could emulate x86 code. Maybe the one they have in four years can. I thought that was a fascinating uh, article about it because, yeah. you know, we've we've gone to Intel and Intel kind of fell behind in in the mobile front, which is surprising because they're the king of of, of these these CPUs. Yeah. How did that happen to them? How did Actually, they fall behind? It's happened to Intel a lot. <laughs> you know, well, yeah, uh, AMD was kicking their ass for a while. I forgot about that. Yeah, and and the whole core chipset, um, the original one, the core, you know, the core duo, the before there was a core two duo. Um, that came out of um, a group in Israel that had nothing to do with mainstream chip development at, at Intel. They were going down some awful path. I mean, their mobile chips for a long time were really terrible. So this actually is not the first time this has happened to them. You know, we seem to respect Intel for a lot, but you know, they need to be prodded many times to do better. And um, you know, we're seeing it with the Clover Trail stuff now. We, we saw it before with the Core Duo. We, or of course, whatever the first one was called, Core. I guess just the Core. Um, you know, back when they used to have things like Pentium M, you know, yeah, it, company that you Centrino, know, they used to chop the math processor out of their chips so they could sell it to you separate. You know, like this, they're not necessarily, uh, you know, the the most logical companies when it comes to this kind of stuff. So, you know, we'll see. We'll, we'll see, see what happens. happens. Uh, a couple more stories. Uh, actually, this I did when I wrote this. I it wasn't a hundred percent, but Microsoft is retiring Windows Live Messenger. Yeah. And uh, using Skype as their messaging service now. Yeah, which, it's good and bad. Um, you know, when, in what way? Well, how, is it, how is it bad? So I use a messenger and I hate it, right? And the reason I use it is because the people that I want to communicate with are, are uh, many of them are. Some I mean, are people really, it, I've always been baffled by this. Do people use messenger? Yeah. Over AIM? Yep. Like I, I barely use AIM anymore, but I have it, you know, in my... Uh, well, client that I, you know, an iChat, I have uh, iMessage, I have AIM programmed in there. I, I don't know yeah. anybody using it, and I know nobody that uses Messenger. It's kind of a Microsoft thing. So I use Messenger every single day. 
and I hate myself for using it every single day. Um, increasingly, Skype is the communication point of choice for people. So people are pinging me on Skype all the time now with text messages. Um, Skype is a terrible client for text Awful. messages. Terrible. And I don't know, a month or so ago, they announced um, that you can log into Skype using your Messenger account. And so hating Messenger as much as I did, I thought, well, this is it. But I actually went back to Messenger because it was just the, the – I would miss messages all the time because it's just awful the way they do it in Skype. Now I'm thinking they're going to change that. But um, anyway, uh, the, yeah, Messenger will be going away. That makes sense to me. I don't see any reason why Microsoft should have both of these things. In fact, I could make the argument that the link client doesn't need to exist either. So are they, are they planning on any kind of name change or are they just going to say Skype and that's it? I'm sure. No, they'll just use Skype. And Skype will be the primary network that you can you know, connect to, but you'll also be able to connect to uh, Facebook, right? And then to Messenger as well. Yeah, I, it, it, it's, it's interesting because Windows Messenger had a pretty decent video. Cl- I mean, their video s- streaming service was pretty good, the video calls. I don't use it for that. I just use it for text. Yeah, um, it's it's about time. I mean, we're seeing the changes now with Microsoft and and, and Skype and how they're planning on incorporating it. And so far, so good. I mean, I, I nothing to complain about. Some people were scared that they would kill off a lot of the key features that they liked, uh, but we haven't seen them. They pretty much left Skype alone. Yeah, I don't know I'm, if it's a good thing or a bad thing. <laughs> well, I'm hoping they kill off the key features of Messenger that I can't stand, which is which by which I mean all of them. Yeah. <laughs> The instant messaging bit, you know. Another story that has come out this week, uh, and maybe you could shed some light on it, is the Xbox Surface 7-inch gaming tablet. Rumors have been coming out all week about this. Um, right. Any, what do you, where do you stand on it? Oh, wait, anything about this? Um, the one side-related thing I would say, first of all, this is completely plausible. This doesn't surprise me. In fact, I've, I've, Thought for a long time they needed a portable Xbox. I'm not totally convinced that going touch only, like you know, basically making it a big, big phone is such a great what idea. What has? Why, I'm sure you would know. I, I, I've, I've, I haven't been following it, but up until now, I mean, the Xbox has been around for a long time. Why haven't they come out with a mobile device? I don't know. I, I had a, this vision for an Xbox portable Xbox machine that I still think is kind of a great idea, which is basically, if you know what an Xbox controller looks like, it would just be the controller, and all the guts and thing would be inside the controller, and there'd be a little LCD screen on top of it. And that would be like kind of the ultimate, you know, personal first-person shooter machine. You know, it could be like previous-gen Xbox technology, so maybe this thing could come out with the next Xbox, but it would be inside, would be like an Xbox 360. Um, they're never going to do something like that. It's yeah. obviously a ludicrous idea, but I, I, I sort of think it would be <laughs> Um, I don't know why they haven't, but now they don't really have to because now they have Windows Phone, now they have Windows 8 on tablets, and so obviously they have Xbox Live games that runs on these run on these platforms. But a touch experience is very different from the console. So I, a, a traditional, like a a real portable Xbox, I don't think is really in the cards. You know, like a PSP style machine. Like it's too bad. I I, I would actually be pretty excited to own such a thing, but. I mean, the, these rumors are, are kind of going based on that leaked document we saw about the Xbox Surface yep. uh, a while ago. They were saying, you know, they were talking about the screen res. And it, in, the, in that leaked document, uh, it said 7-inch multi-touch LED, LED screen. Sure. So maybe, they're gonna, maybe it's going to be an add-on. Maybe it's going to be a companion for the next generation Xbox. Well, right. It, it will probably be Windows RT. And it, probably, it will be an add-on in the same way that an RT devices with Xbox uh, smart class. So we'll see. I, I have heard from a source that seems credible that the rumors of the Microsoft Surface phone are real, that that thing's real. That and they're that, making their own own phone. Not necessarily to release it in the marketplace yet. I think it's still in the testing phase, but uh, the person that I heard from most recently, seemed, I, it's the first person time I've heard from them, so I can't vouch for them yet, but um, the information seemed very credible and it's plausible. Too, right you know it's easy to write a story where you say oh they're going to make an xbox tablet you know or they're going to make a surface phone it's like yeah sure because that's it sounds believable right it's plus well i i actually thought they they would i mean i know that they teamed up with nokia you know yeah. a while back but i thought they would actually take the nokia phone and just rebrand in microsoft and nokia right. would make the phone for them well on the flip side i always thought that a um a nokia tablet styled like the lumia with the same materials would be really cool 
Of course, based on the way the 920 came out, that thing would be like three inches thick and way more than my car. But yeah. it's a beautiful looking design, you know. I guess an even more beautiful looking design would be one based on the, um, you know, the HTC 8X or whatever. But, you know, I don't know if we'll see stuff like that. But I, the, the problem I have with the phone is I get why they do it in the PC market because PC makers have so thoroughly screwed up the PC experience that they needed to do it. But on the phone side, that's not the case. They they engineered Windows Phone in such a way that the the wireless carriers and the, the and the hardware makers could not screw up the experience. So when you buy a Windows Phone, whether it's version seven X or eight, and AT and T has splashed all their stupid apps all over it that you don't want, you can actually delete all of them, which is something you can't do on a lot of like say Verizon Android phones or whatever, where they have these pre built or pre bundled apps that you can't get rid of. Um, the way Windows Phone is, is you can get rid of those things. And so if you don't want that, you don't want to see them, you can just get rid of them. And I think that's, it's the right approach, but more important, it suggests that Microsoft doesn't need to make a, a Surface phone of their own. Uh, yeah, I, I think, you know, uh, the fact that they're a software company and they're making hardware, it, it kind of works better than a hardware company making software. Well, they're a devices and services company, so I don't know what you mean by software. Oh, uh, yes, 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 yes. Devices and services. I forgot. I forgot. <laughs> Software. It's, Does Microsoft even make software? I forgot about that. They changed. They, they changed it on their little header on their website. But <laughs> it, it is an interesting idea because we've seen Sony, for example, which is a hardware company, do an awful job with the user interface on almost every device that they make ever made in the history in the history of the company. Every user, or every UI on every Sony product is awful. And they just don't get it. They don't get how to connect to the end user. They, they make great hardware, but unfortunately, it's awful to run because the software is horrible. Uh, we've seen it with, v I mean, the Vita was a little better, but it's the same. So it's, a, it's a Sony device. You know the second you pick it up and you start the thing. Any Sony remote. Any Sony remote, yeah. Uh, just, Nintendo but. has, by the way, I did get a chance to play around with the Wii U. Yeah. Uh, and I guess we'll tie it in now. Uh, I played with it over the weekend. Um, I wasn't supposed to, but I, I had a good 35, 40 minutes with the thing. Mm -hmm. And I have to tell you, I was very impressed. Uh, the games are, they're great. It looks much better than the regular Wii. It's high def. Uh, it's Nintendo, so it's, you know, very kiddish. It, it's easy to learn. But that, you know, the, the, what, the Wii U pad, right? That's what they're calling it. Or am I totally making that up? The controller that has a touchscreen. The, the controller that has a touchscreen. Wii U pad. I think that's what it is. Yes, the Wii U pad. The Wii U game pad. I'm sorry. The touchscreen is... Uh, this entire device, this entire t controller feels like it's about to fall, fall apart in my hands. Really cheap. Uh, the touchscreen... I was actually... One thing that I was very impressed is that it's pretty responsive, which you do not see... From any uh, other, you know, other than a, a software maker that that has hardware, uh, <laughs> that makes the hardware. It's an awful experience. Like, I was thinking it would be something in between an iPad and a Garmin GPS. Oh. You know, when you touch that thing, it takes forever. Right. Um, I, got an, I got a great can Canon camera that we're using, the HFG10. And the touch on that thing, you got to literally push it and bend the screen so it it responds the the response of the screen was excellent but every time i pushed it the screen bent so yeah. really poorly made i mean it's 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 a really cheap device so if you think wow look how great that is it it, it looks actually that it's built well it is not built well built really cheap and they have to make it cheap because they're selling the entire thing for three hundred dollars and when you buy a tablet it's costing you the same i'm not i wonder i, I haven't seen it so i can't, I can't say firsthand but obviously these things are designed for children so it can't really be cheap i mean this, if these things just fell apart as soon as you use them as they would if a kid was beating on it i don't know if it's designed for kids i, I don't i don't know if, if i i think nintendo has a nintendo feel to it but they do have a lot of adult games on there i mean they have i mean a lot of the the titles that are on the ps3 and um and the xbox they're they're on nintendo mm. i don't think the hardcore user is going to buy it I think, you know what, no, they probably will buy it, but they won't be playing, you know, Call of Duty on that thing. Sure. I don't know why you would. <laughs> but it's interesting because I got it immediately. I picked it up and I got the whole thing. 
I, I, I understood it. But I was very surprised on how cheap the screen is. Hmm. And how they were able to... I mean, also what's surprising is that they were able to put this thing together for $300. Right. With the actual device and the screen. So... I don't know. I'm kind of in the middle. I played around with it. I played Mario a little bit. I played, um, I played like their their Nintendo, you know, fun pack that you know, the little Weebles, whatever they call them. I think Mies. they're called the Mies, Weebles. What are they? Uh, not bad at all. But for 300 bucks, totally worth it. But I see this thing being demolished within a couple of months. People are going to say that they broke the screen and they took their stylus and they pushed a little too hard on it. And the whole thing just exploded in their hands. If uh, Nintendo does not outsell the Xbox 360, this thing with this thing, uh, that has got to be the end of the road for, for Nintendo. Things. Yeah, I mean, if they if they come up with a new console and they have this one year head start and it's HD and everything, it's all brand new. If they don't like consistently beat the Xbox 360, which is obviously in, the, in swan song phase, that's uh, that represents a serious problem. But you know, I'm not seeing a buzz. Um, it's coming out. I th I think in 12 days it gets released. And it's a tough pe time. people Halo. are more excited about Halo 4 than they are about this new console. Call of Duty coming next week. Yeah. It, 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 do you think it's going to sell? I, I don't know. I don't think I don't think it's going to have the buzz that it did last time. Yes. Relatively speaking, right? I mean, obviously, yeah. the, the Wii had this huge advanced billing going on. It was, it was clearly going to be a big deal. And this one, it's like, eh. You know, I, I don't know. It's it. I mean, it's pretty much a Wii in high def. That's all it is. It was exciting because it was sort of uh, gesture kind of gaming before anyone really had it. And it was uh, pretty good. It, it worked. Yeah, and and you could use little um, props, you know, like to golf, do a golf swing or a baseball bat swing, whatever. Um, this thing seems like obviously an evolved version of that, but also touchscreen stuff. But we've had touchscreens for a long time now. Like this is not particularly innovative. I mean. Um, I guess it would just depend on the whole experience and whether or not Nintendo still has a really positive name brand with families, you know, and kids. I think it does. I think so. I, I, there's a cool factor. There's a gimmick factor behind it. Um, I found the, the two screens a little distracting because yeah. I didn't know what to look at at times. So I was going like this the entire time. Uh, but it, it was it was it was fun. I mean, I, I, I probably will buy it. I won't wait in line. I don't know if I'll buy it instantly, but it, it was all right. But I was I just wanted to comment on, on the quality of it because we had discussed how responsive the touchscreen is going to be. And people were complaining that it wasn't responsive. Is this and, really the fun? What is that? Are you sure that this is like the shipping version and not some prototype? Or? I, you know, that, that, that's a good question. I, I believe this is the shipping version. Hmm. I mean, if it is, I think you're going to have a lot of people breaking this thing. <laughs> for all of my complete lack of interest in Nintendo generally, I, I've never really thought that their products were shoddily made. I mean, the the Wii is like the Wii controllers all seem, you know, of reasonable quality for that kind of thing. And I, I'm I'm surprised to hear it's that bad. Yeah, I mean, who knows? Maybe maybe I was totally wrong, and and it wasn't maybe some some beta version of it. But I don't think that was the case. I didn't even ask to be honest. Um. I had some time to play with it. He said, don't tell anybody that, that I let you play around with this because uh, the stores don't even have the demos yet. Right. So uh, they actually have it, have the demos. It's disabled. You can't play any games on them. If you, if you've, if you've walked into like a GameStop, you could see, you could, you could see it there, but there's nothing there. It's just playing a demo. Right. Which is bizarre to me. Um, it's five o'clock. We're running a little behind, but I do want to do our what if of the week. So last week we did what if uh, Windows 8 did not have desktop. It only what if it, it was only desktop and no Metro. Right. So this week, let's do what if there was no desktop <laughs> and it was only Metro? What would the perception of the operating system been? What would have people been saying about it? Um, now, there's two there's two arguments. One is Metro complete. Because there's a lot of features that are in the the desktop mode that are yep. not you. There's no access to it from Metro. So let's go with the hypothetical that everything is working. Paul, where, how, what do you think people would say? 
You know, honestly, I think they could have launched that thing this week and it would have sold just as well as the one they're selling because I don't, I don't really don't think people understood what they were getting anyway. And, um, you know, you still have that same problem. This is not a big apps market yet. Although, that, by the way, that thing is already growing pretty fast every day and it is obviously going to get there. But, I mean, that's just not, just a number, Paul. How many how many applications do do we actually need? Yeah, no, I can't answer that because everyone seems to think this is the biggest deal in the world. But the trick is you go into the store and you look at what's there. And, you know, there's a Bank of America app that just popped up recently. Um, you know, there's there's like apps are occurring. And so obviously there's a lot of crap. But as these days go by, you know, Microsoft announced a bunch of Xbox Live games that are going to come out any day now. Um, obviously, there's some big players that should be coming out with some big stuff soon. And, you know, we'll see. I, I, I think that stuff is going to take care of itself. So. I, in some ways, launching that thing that way would have been more honest because there would have been no sense that the desktop hinted at better capabilities, that you're buying a pure play iPad style product. You know, or I think I described it as a, um, a pure, you know, kind of rendition of this metro future. You know, that obviously Windows 8 would have to include the desktop for backwards compatibility, and lots of people are going to want that. But there's some people who just want the touch stuff, and, and there it is, this pure touch-based laptop. I think it would have been more iPad-like, and um, you know, assuming they could have made it happen, would have been preferable in some ways, where you know, the, the issues you might have on ARM with performance and so forth might matter a little bit less if all you're doing is running the handful of Metro uh, apps that are available. Yeah, I mean... If they had, let's let's say they had gone that way, I, I could have seen them saying, okay, listen, we understand that you're still, a lot of people are still using the traditional desktop. We'll, mm -hmm. we'll extend support for Windows 7. We'll still do updates for it for X amount of time, which they, of course, they always do because XP was supported for a long time. Sure. Still is. It still is. And, uh, but this is our, this is our future. This is where we're going. And I think at first a lot of people would have said, okay, well, I, I don't want to upgrade, but every time you bought a new computer, guess what? That's what it comes with. Right. I don't think people are going out and buying the operating system. So, you know what? It probably wouldn't have made a big difference. People would still bought it, um, and it would have been a fresh start. It might have, might have forced them to fix some of the issues that we're going to start seeing uh, and people are going to have a little bit faster. Well, yeah, I mean, and then you get this notion where Windows 8 is the pro version because it's superset. It has all the backwards compatibility plus the new stuff. And then Windows RT is just this pure version of it. You know, it's just, yeah. it's, you know, their iPad. I mean, I'm not sure how else to say it. Um, couldn't have had Office, I guess. Um, on what, had, RT? Yeah, I mean, in other words, you get rid of the desktop, so there's no Office, because the Office team did not have time to develop uh, Office, you know, a Metro version of Office. But do you think they could have done this for desktop? They could have totally limited, I mean, I, I'm sorry, for the PC, for, you know, regular computers, just killed off desktop? No. You don't think it would it would have been even slightly possible at this point? No. You gotta do the the Windows eight version that has the desktop. But yeah. I'm, what I'm saying is the RT version shouldn't have. And yeah. It just wasn't ready. But if it could have been ready, that would have been more interesting and it would have been more honest, you know? It would the people would have known what they were getting into. By I mean, obviously <laughs> there are always people who have no idea what they're yeah, buying. Yeah, it, it's very confusing to me, uh still, uh that I was I, I was actually not confused, but I was still really surprised that I was using desktop as much as I was. Right. It, yep. it was it was actually I was like, wait a minute, <laughs> I didn't expect this, and I don't think a lot of people did. You know, I, I think a lot of people bought this device. I think a lot of people are still buying Windows Windows Eight, and they're they're thinking it's this new operating system. It's and then it's Windows. Yeah, like oh, look at that! Look at that! It's there. It's not as bad as I thought. No, I, I got I got an email today from some guy who said, um, you know, what's the story with Windows 8 and Adobe Desktop applications? I mean, is there any difference there? And and that kind of this guy, you know, he's not stupid. I mean, he just doesn't know. And um, there's no story. It's it's Windows 7. It just it works exactly the same way, you know. But people just don't understand it because I, you know, there is this vague notion that you know this is a completely new thing which it is in some ways but you know on the windows 8 side you, you carry forward all the old stuff as well uh jimmy fowl says i'm confused why you're in desktop at all other than use off as well if i want to do any kind of uh 
any kind of uh, system changes, you're you're automatically in there because control panel's still there. Yeah. Uh, and and there's well, a yeah, the command lines in there, PowerShell's in there, uh, disk manager and computer management is still in there. If you're looking uh, for files, I mean, you're still in. You're using Windows Explorer. Yeah, the actual networking stuff is still in there. And, and that's you know, it, it will change, but yeah, today uh, you you need it. It is the way it is. All right, Paul. Time to wrap it up. Uh, okay. People go to Paul's website, winsupersite.com. And uh, to get all your Paul information, uh, Paul also does a show Windows Weekly every Thursday uh, at 2 p.m. East on the Twit Network. Uh, anything else, Paul, that you're doing? Are, are, you, are you settled in after this? You mean travel-wise? Travel-wise, I mean, are you done for the year? Uh, I hope so. I don't have any plans yet. Um, it's possible I might do a little bit of uh, personal travel later, but I'm, my intention is to stay home for a couple of weeks at yeah. least. I'm a little burned out on traveling. Now, hopefully you'll be home for Thanksgiving. Yes. That's so. the hope. Uh, if you miss any portion of the show, you could go to our website, gfknetwork.com. You can subscribe to us. We're on iTunes. I would say we're on Zoom, but uh, the links are dead, guys. So people have been saying, how come there's no more Zoom links on your site? Because Zoom uh, has removed all links if you have a windows phone you of course you can subscribe to us on a windows phone but uh nothing else it takes you nowhere if you click on our zoom link how you can subscribe on on itunes and get it on windows phone 8 yeah yeah uh anything else nothing else i got nothing oh follow paul on twitter at the rot i'm andrew zarian on twitter you can follow me and uh that's it i think we're done All right, guys, uh, take care and uh, see you next week on What the Tech. Good night, everybody.